So today I want to talk about peace. As you know, this year, last year I did themes uh, every month, and this year we're just doing questions. And the question that we're looking at this month is how do we live? How do we express as the lights that we are? And the talk today is called Powered by Peace because I truly think there's no other energy that powers us other than peace and love. And I want to start out with a story that for me illustrates um, what true inner peace is. Now, one thing I like to do is if people have a different thought, just shout it out. This is not Melanie talking to you. If anybody has a thought, just say it because that makes it, makes it way more fun. There's a story in the Taoist tradition which goes as follows. Once upon a time in ancient China, the emperor was in his study and he was highly agitated and he was walking to and fro and he just could not understand why he could not find his own inner peace. He said, he called it his advisor and he said, have the best artists in the land paint me pictures that will give me inner peace, that show me peace. Have them paint them and bring them to me. So, you know, weeks later, three artists show up. And the advisor comes out and says, Majesty, I think I found the pictures for you. The first one is a beautiful mountainscape. And it's got snow and water and peace, and it is so beautiful. I'm sure it will give you that feeling of inner peace. And the emperor said, that's very nice. What's the next one? The next one was a beautiful lake. And it was calm, and there were trees, and it was, you just wanted to go there because it was so beautiful and peaceful. The emperor said, I love that. That, that makes me feel warm inside. I feel, I, I feel peaceful now. He said, let's look at the last one. The last one, the emperor looked at it, and the advisor said, no, 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 sir, I'm sorry. That must not be right. This cannot be the correct picture. The artist misunderstood. And the emperor said, no, that's the picture. That's the one I want. And he looked at the picture, and the picture was of a raging, wild, chaotic, loud waterfall making all this noise. It was, the, it was the last thing you would think of when you think of peace. But there in the bow of a little tree next to the waterfall was a bird sleeping, right next to all that noise. And the emperor said, that is peace. Because in the midst of all that noise, in the midst of all that chaos, in the heart of that bird is the calm to be able to sleep. That is truly inner tranquility. So that's just like the picture on the front of your program. Have you looked at the picture on the front of your program? I love this picture. Let me go grab this picture. It's, you know, I got to tell you, I love, I, I, Chris Kell does these pictures. Thank you, Chris, if you're watching. And welcome back again to our online community. This is a great picture. I'm one of those mothers who, when I'm in the supermarket, and you know there's a kid like in the next aisle who's just screaming and laying down, and everyone's like, oh, get rid of that kid. I'm smiling. I love it because I think, that's not my kid. <laughs> I'm thinking, been there, done that, not me, go with God. <laughs> but that is what this picture is. It's like you got kids, balls, things breaking. And there is this lady just being peaceful. That's kind of the, the modern day equivalent of, you know, the bird singing next to the waterfall. So... It does not look like a peaceful scenario, but it doesn't matter because she's got it in here. When you have, and the point of all this is when you have it here, when you can bring your own peace with you to whatever is happening, that is when you have reliable inner peace that stays with you. It's the ability to remain calm and at peace while the torrent swirls around you. So Derek Lynn, the guy who uh, translated the story I just told, he talks about it a little more. He says it's possible to take the point of the above story and just leave it at that, but he says let's look at it a little more deeply. Okay, so the painting, the second painting, was a calm lake. However, he suggests that that's really kind of a false tranquility because we know how water works, right? You have the calm surface, and then you have all the activity below it. So it's a superficial calm. It's kind of a deceptive calm. And how many times in our lives, it's certainly true in my life, when things are going south and everything's swirling and whirling, and you just walk away from it in order to try to feel peaceful. You don't try to reach that calm center. You distract yourself. You do something else. You just go for the superficial calm, the passing calm as opposed to the truly deep, 
uh, restorative sense of peace. You go for that superficial peace, which is kind of like the, um, the lake. He talks about the painting of the snow. He said the painting of the snow, the mountains and the snow and the trees and all of that stuff, that's an environment of peace. That's where we can take ourselves to a place of peace. But if we are not peaceful within, are we really there? Remember a couple weeks ago I was talking to you about Seneca the Stoic? I love Stoics. And what Seneca said was that you have to bring your own peaceful mind with you. And you can travel from resort to resort to resort to beautiful place to beautiful place and run through all your money. But wherever you go, there you are. So an environment of peace is not to be relied on because you take your troubles with you, you take your distractions with you, your fears. It doesn't matter. You have to rely on yourself, on your own inner heart to bring it to you. To go back to my favorite Stoics, we always have the ability to choose how we respond. And if we make the decision to respond from a place of peace, then we will continue to shine as the peace that we are. And i got to tell you, this week for me has been a very tough week. For those who know, I'm a lawyer, um, I have an outside job, and I have a big trial next week. It starts in less than 24 hours. Okay, so my week has been basically, as my daughter would say, H-E double hockey sticks, hell on a bicycle. You know, witnesses, meetings, stuff. It's just been, but I thought, going back to what we talk about here, I have the choice of the persona I'm going to bring there. And what did we talk about when we talked about the Stoics? We talked about <clears throat> how the events in your life are not the, they're not the true inner you. They are preferred indifference or dispreferred indifference. Do you remember that? Bad things that happen to us are just that. They're like the ball we play with. Remember when I was throwing tennis balls around here with my sister? They're like the ball we play with. They don't change. We get the choice as to how we want to handle it. Because when you go to a sporting contest like the Olympics now, you go to look at the creativity and the skill with which these people are playing the game. You don't go to a football game to watch the football. You go to watch the players, right? So we get to choose this creativity, the skill, the heart, the resilience, the courage that we bring to the circumstances of our lives. And so every moment during this week, which has been a challenging week, I have had the chance to say, is this how I want to show up? Do I want to be shrill? Do I want to be rude? Do I want to be sarcastic? And I'm so good at all those things. <laughs> but the answer is no, because it brings such a bad, I was like, no, you're not. Oh, yes, I am. But it brings such a, it, it just spreads. It just spreads that energy to every, it poisons everything you touch. So this week has been a school for me in how to bring peace to the circumstances in which I have found myself. And I've spoken before about one of my favorite personal examples, and sometimes what I like to do is, is just talk about people I admire, because that's one way I think we learn, is by looking at people who are admirable and just seeing how they did it in lives of challenge and similarity to ours. And the lady I want to talk about today was a woman who called herself Peace Pilgrim. Has anybody heard of Peace Pilgrim? Who's heard of Peace Pilgrim? Okay, a few people. Yeah, a few people have heard of Peace Pilgrim. She was born in 1908 in Egg Harbor City, New Jersey. Her name was Mildred Lizette Norman. She was the oldest of three kids of a couple who owned a poultry farm. Her parents installed an ethic of deep peace in her. This is parents among you never do this if you want your kids to be normal. Deep peace, and they taught her to be a free thinker. Oh my God, you get what you pay for. This woman grew up, she entered a traditional marriage, it fell apart because she was anything but traditional. And she started living a life which was directed toward what her own heart told her she needed to do. Uh, after the Great Depression, she made two important discoveries. The first important discovery was that making money was easy. The second one was that making and spending it was meaningless. Think about that. It was easy, and it was also meaningless. You know, it's nice to have, I mean, we have to think of Maslow here. We need enough to be able to survive, but at some point, it does become meaningless. She knew that she had to be here for some other reason. So in 1939, she spent a night walking through the woods, seeking spiritual guidance. 
See, that's the sort of thing I always love to do, but I've never actually gotten up to do it. Anyway, she did. She spent a night walking through the woods seeking spiritual guidance. And she underwent what she called a great spiritual experience in which she felt that God had called her to a special life of service. She said for her it was a point of no return. And I know we've all felt those. We've all felt points of no return. It was the beginning of what she called living to give, not to get. Okay, so nothing immediate happened. She spent the next decade searching for her purpose and calling. She worked with senior citizens. She worked with people with emotional problems. She volunteered for peace organizations. She began to simplify. One thing I like about Peace Program is she didn't think, I'm going to wait till things are perfect. I'm going to wait till everything lines up. I'm going to wait till I'm rich or thin. She just started doing it right then in the little steps that she could do it. What was it Mother Teresa said that we learned? We do what is in front of us. And that's what she did. She did what was in front of her. She, got, she began to get rid of unnecessary possessions. She reduced her wardrobe to two dresses. That's what folks wore back then. Okay, dresses. <laughs> she, became, <laughs> she became, if I owned one by God, I would wear it. <laughs> She became a vegetarian. She just, she, she tried to live on $10 a month. Okay, that might be $200 a month now. I don't know because I'm not an economist. But she reduced it. She wanted to learn what she called the great freedom of simplicity. She started to build up her physical stamina. She started going on hikes, really long hikes, because she sensed that's what she was going to do. On January 1st in 1953, at the age of 44, she adopted the name Peace Pilgrim. She put on a blue tunic, because blue is the international color of peace. She wrote Peace Pilgrim on it in big blue letters. And between that day and her death 28 years later in 1981, she crossed the United States seven times on foot, and she walked over 25,000 miles. At some point, she just stopped counting. She just walked. She carried in her tunic pockets. Her possessions were a toothbrush, a comb, a pen, and later she wrote a pamphlet, Steps to Inner Peace. And she carried that, and she gave it away. She took a vow to walk penniless and to remain a wanderer until mankind had learned the way of peace. Don't you know she would still be walking today? Well, maybe she's passed the mantle to folks like us. She vowed to continue walking until mankind learned the way of peace. Walking until given shelter and fasting until given food. She didn't have a 501c3. She didn't have a little minivan driving behind her with bottles of water. She didn't have any of that. She just started walking. She took no money. She would talk to anybody who wanted to talk to her. If she didn't have a place to stay, she would sleep by the side of the road. She introduced herself to people as a pilgrim, not walking to a place, but walking for an idea. Just walking, because she couldn't sit still in a world that was not at peace. And so she did what she could. Just walked. Her peace message was this. This is the way of peace, overcome evil with good, falsehood with truth, and hatred with love. Don't you think sometimes we make it so hard? Don't you think sometimes we just make it so hard? It's not that hard. You know, sometimes I wonder, what am I going to get up and say 52 weeks of the year? <coughs> of my schedule, fewer than that. But okay, you get the point. It's the same message. Live with love. Live with kindness. Do what is in front of you. There's only so many ways to say it. The challenge is to get up and do it. And that is what communities like us help each of us do. Every week we, get, we come, we get a little infusion of this is how I should live. We can gather here and be the way we should authentically be. Be the way here we should be everywhere. Authentic and loving and truthful and honest and kind and supportive. It's not hard. What's hard is just to get up and do it. Don't you think? Yeah, it ain't hard to think about. It's just hard to get up and do. And Peace Pilgrim is one who did it. Her definition of peace included peace among nations, among people, and among individuals, and the most important peace within oneself. Because without peace within yourself, 
no other kinds can be achieved. In an essay she wrote of her path to peace, she said, each of us has our own, but these were the steps that she found instructive to her. She began with four what she called preparations. And I share these with you just to think about. They may be useful, make your own, because what is it we learn here? We learn from other people, but at the end of the day, whatever we learn, we have to make it our own. We have to get it up and put it on in a suit of clothes that fits us. So this is what Peace Pilgrim wrote. She said, assume the right attitude toward life. She would have been wonderfully comfortable here because she was a free thinker, right? Okay. Her belief was that no problem ever comes to you that does not have a purpose in your life. Do you find that to be true? I think that's very refreshing and I hate it. <laughs> all these problems keep coming to me and I'm sure they have a purpose, but I'm like, can I just have a purpose that like is calm? You know, I mean, can the law of attraction just bring me something that is like friendly and nice and wonderful instead of all these great life lessons? Okay, fine. They are there for a purpose. She tells us to face life squarely, to live through our problems instead of what she called living on the surface and escaping them. We live through, it's like the Red Sea in the Christian scriptures. Did they go around the Red Sea? No, they went through them. That's what we do. We go through them and we take the lessons, we take the support, the love and the experience, and we come out different and changed on the other side. That's what she did during the, her years of discontent and discomfort. She could have stayed where she was with more than two dresses. She could have told herself that this is the way life is. This marriage is fine. I'll be okay. I've got a nice home. I'll go buy a toaster. Who knows what she could have told herself in those days. But she didn't. She realized it was not enough, and she had the courage to get up and realize that her true north lay someplace else, that her dream and her accomplishments and her impact and her heart lay someplace else. In Joseph Campbell's language, she answered the call, and she stepped into her soul's highest adventure. And see, that's what we want to avoid. None of us want to go down thinking we missed our soul's highest adventure, do we? It's out there. Each of us has one. And we don't want to left it unsung. Because what a waste would that be? Her second point was live all the good things you believe in. Now that's a tall order. This is a process. Remember it took her 10 years from her walk in the woods to I'm going to put on this blue tunic and hit the road. Right? Live all the good things you believe in. But, do, but don't kick yourself around for not getting up and leaving this room and doing it right now. It is a process. But be aware, if she was doing something that she didn't believe in, she would stop doing it. She would stop doing it quickly. She said the believing took a while to catch up with the doing. So what you do is you look at the activities that you are doing. And if they do not respond to what you think is your soul's integrity, don't do them. Sometimes our activities lead us to our beliefs. Isn't that the way you find it. Sometimes we behave in a certain way, and then after we've behaved that way a while, we come to believe it. C.S. Lewis said, do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. I mean, that's kind of the way it works. If you can't find it in your heart to emotionally get behind the behavior you know is right, do it anyway. And one day you will wake up and be surprised. Her third point was find your place in the life pattern. And her teaching here was you have a part in the scheme of things. What that part is, only you know. I can't tell you what it is. The DVD you just bought can't tell you what it is. You know what it is. You know your soul's highest purpose. And you know your place in the life pattern. You can seek it in the silence, you can seek it in meditation, in journaling, in chanting, in whatever you do. Howling at the moon, don't care. You know what it is, and you know the best way to find it. You can begin to live in accordance with it by doing the good things you are motivated toward, and by avoiding those things which make you uneasy or uncomfortable. That is how you find it. You find it by keeping in tune every choice with what is in accord with you and your life's purpose and your heart. Because you know the answer to that. In terms of the life pattern, she wrote, if you know but do not do, 
If you know but do not do, you are a very unhappy person indeed. And none of us want to go there. She wrote of the need to simplify. Simplify life to bring inner and outer well-being into harmony. She wrote, unnecessary possessions are just burdens. When we moved, we moved from like a 3,300 square feet, foot house into a 1,700 square foot house, doubled the number of dogs, had the same number of kids. But it was really much simpler. And I found the energy was so different. It just, we got rid of so much stuff, and I loved it. None of it was necessary. You know, if you haven't touched something in a few months, you probably don't need it. Even stuff you attach sentimental significance to. My law school graduation, I had like a beautiful green binder, leather binder, invitations, pictures of me graduating from law school, you know, decades ago. I'm not even going to go there. And I looked at it and I said, that's nice trash. It's like, <laughs> gone. You know, stuff you just don't need, get rid of it. You will feel so much lighter. Unnecessary possessions are a burden. Unnecessary activities may also be burdens. Take a look at your life, is what she did. And she said, do I really need to be doing this? Is this a place where I want to put my time? The lesson here is, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. How many people have asked us to do that? Oh, you're so good at that. You'd be great at this party. You'd be great doing that. We're all great at a lot of things. We're lucky, thank God. It doesn't mean we need to do them. I so admire people who have boundaries. You know, I would love to help you with that, but I just can't. Asha sent me something the other day. She said she sent me this book to look at, and it's about a happy and healthy nonprofit, and it talks about work-life balance. And I called her up and I said, I think that's just ducky. I'd love to hear it. I just need a tutorial on what that is. <laughs> work-life balance. I don't get it. You know, I just don't get it. But... There's a need to simplify, to breathe, to not do things that don't build us up. And it's not to say you sit and think about yourself all the time, but you know what your limits are. You know what your boundaries are. You know where you best serve and where you are just burning yourself out. Those are things you know. So simplify your life to do things that benefit you, that benefit others, but not just because you can and finally, she talked about a few other ways. These are kind of drill-down things that she talked about, and they're more in the mode of how she simplified. She talked about purification of our bodies, okay? Eating well, sleeping well, not over-consuming alcohol, not doing drugs, whatever. Do what is good for your body at whatever your stage in your life is. Exercise. I mean, we know what that means. And I also know for me, if I don't do all that stuff, I start feeling like 10 miles of bad road. You just don't want to be around me if I'm not taking care of myself physically. And I sense probably other people are the same way. That's, that's taking care of the little suit you travel around in. We all have to do that. Purification of the thoughts. Okay, she would be a new thought person if she were with us. Our thoughts define our reality, don't they? We know this to be true. So be careful of what you assume. Be careful of what you judge. Be careful of what you believe and examine them. Because a lot of times we carry stuff around unexamined for decades. And we just believe and believe and believe until someone says, is that really true? And you take a look and you go, no, it's really not. So take a look at what the assumptions are that power your life. I remember a couple weeks ago, remember we talked about commitments. We talked about what we are committed to, and that requires us to be aware of what we are thinking, what we are knowing, what we are believing, the basis for our actions. Purify your thoughts. Just take a look at what you're thinking and why you believe what it is you believe. She talked about motives. Motives, she said, should not be greedy or self-seeking or the wish for self-glorification or ego. How much, and this is a tough one for me, but how much do we do out of the need for people to recognize how cool we are, how whatever we are, how, I won't go into how well-dressed we are, but how, whatever it is, whatever face we want to put out, how much energy do we put into that? It's hard sometimes to give up all that and just realize that what other people think about me, and I'm not the first one to say this, what other people think about me is none of my business. I see Gates saying that. Yeah, it's not. My business is what I do. 
what I say, how I act. So think about what you are doing in order to put on a face, in order for people to perceive you a certain way. Because that, in a sense, is a fool's errand. Because it will never be enough. There's always more to get. All we can do is what we think and what we do. That's all we can control and how we show up in the world, not what people think of us. So, I love Peace Pilgrim because she had courage, she had commitment, and it was also one of those things where when she started walking, she was not Peace Pilgrim. She was some lady named Mildred in a blue tunic walking the highway. But think about that. Think about when, when you think, there's nothing I can do. I'm just me. How can I change the world? How can I make a difference? The people who we admire now, they didn't start out that way. They started out just standing up and putting one foot in front of the other. And they didn't give up. They continued to believe. And they probably also continued to think they had no choice. Because this is who they were meant to be and how they were meant to show up. So as you think of your life, as you think of your week and your coming month, take heart in that. Because we can all start out that way. Nobody may be given talks about us in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, but it doesn't matter. Because each of us can get up right now and with love and compassion and commitment do the thing that's right in front of you. And we never know how that will turn out. Thank you. So I invite you to take out your gift.